uh, presence of everyone. Appreciate the presence of everyone here tonight. <clears throat> I'll present the uh, lesson. And I hope, uh, you know, sometimes I have a tendency to run over, and so I hope the uh, teacher of the class will not object too strenuously to me having done so. But I'd like to talk to you about uh, uh, all the spiritual blessings we have in Christ. All spiritual blessings are found in Christ, Ephesians 1 3, and, and once in Christ, as it says, in part, in Romans 8, chapter verses 39, 35 through 39, what shall separate, separate us from the love of Christ? And on down below, it says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which <clears throat> is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Yet, uh, indeed, some are separated from Christ, such as uh, Demas, who had loved this present world, forsook the apostle uh, Paul, and we as faithful Christians are not to be so proud that we do not heed the needful things, and thereby fall. Paul warned the Corinthians, as recorded in 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, verse 12, therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. To be wholly acceptable to God is to be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding and to walk uh, that we may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Colossians, the first uh, chapter, verse 9 through 10. Christ said that the one who does not take his cross and follow after him is not worthy of him, Matthew 10th chapter, verse 38. The disposition of the heart uh, will determine the focus of the life. It is recorded that our Lord said, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, Matthew 6, chapter, verse 21. We are urged to keep our heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life, Proverbs, the fourth chapter, verse 23. In Colossians, the third chapter, verses one through four, we are advised to seek those things which are above and not on things of the earth. There are several parables in the 13th chapter of the book of Matthew dealing with the nature of the kingdom and of those to whom appeal would be made. First appearing in this great chapter is that parable commonly known as the parable of the soils. In the explanation of the parable, Jesus says that the soils are representative of the hearts of men. And of course, the seed is the word of God. The wayside soil is representative of those whose heart is so hardened by evil, perverse thoughts, indifference or thoughtless acceptance of tradition as to be impenetrable by the word of God. The second soil, the, the stony places, had no depth to withstand the trials and tribulations of life, which will come our way. And they soon gave up any sustenance of uh, the seed, that is, the word of God. Uh, such is the heart of the impetuous one who, in the emotion of the moment, exceeds to most anything, not counting the cost of growing and producing for the kingdom. The third soil was good soil in that it was a favorable medium for germination and sustenance of growth. However, contained within that soil were the thorns as well as, as the good fruit. The soil readily accepted the good seed, nurtured it to life, and sustained its growth. It also provided for the growth of the thorns. Consequently, the thorns choked the very life out of the offspring of the good seed so that no fruit was produced. Of course, the fourth seed represents the good and honest heart who upon hearing the word, that is the seed, believes it, understands it, and keeps it there by producing fruit many times over. The heart of man represented by the third soil believes the word and is obedient to its first demands. Such a one, however, is so preoccupied with the concern of his earthly existence that Christ 
is no longer Lord of his life. Christ is not held in preeminence above all else. We see in this person the desire to have it both ways. One cannot work at cross purposes with the Lord and still be acceptable to him. Christ said, he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad, Matthew 12, chapter verse 30. Our loyalties cannot be divided. Our Lord said that no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. We cannot serve God and mammon, Matthew 6, chapter verse 24. Let us not lose sight of the fact that caring for the necessities of this life, the obtaining or owning of material riches or other things, or engaging in pleasurable activities are not in and of themselves condemned. <clears throat> it is to be condemned, however, when these things are in competition with Christ for preeminence in our heart. The heart, as we have noted, is the center of all activities. When a certain lawyer of the Pharisees in tempting Jesus asked, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Matthew, the 27, uh, 22nd chapter, verses 36 to 37. There must be a genuine love of God filling the heart of man. There may be no acceptable competitor to the love of God in the heart of man. By the very nature of man's physical existence and the necessities to sustain such, he must have some care for the things of this world. Paul commanded that if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat, 2 Thessalonians 3rd chapter verse 10. Also, Timothy stated, but if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his own household, he has denied faith and is worth, worse than an unbeliever or infidel, as the King James says. That's 1 Timothy, the fifth chapter, verse eight. <clears throat> so taking care of the needs of this life is not condemned, but is, in, or rather is impressed upon the faithful as a duty. Indeed, the virtuous woman of Proverbs, the 31st chapter, verse 10, was commended for her attentiveness to, attentiveness to the needs of her family. Are the necessities which sustain life important? Does God know we have need of them? Well, it certainly does, and certainly it is. Jesus made it abundantly clear as recorded in Matthew 6, chapter verses 25 through 32, that your heavenly Father knows you need food and clothing. It is not that the daily necessities of life which sustain flesh are unimportant. It is simply that such must not have priority in our lives above spiritual matters. We are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, Matthew 6, 33. At a feast prepared for Jesus, uh, as we found we find in Luke 10th chapter, verse 38 through 42, Martha was described as distracted with much serving. Meanwhile, uh, meanwhile, Martha's sister, Mary, sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. So we have contrasted in Martha and Mary the care for the bread of this world, which perishes, and care for the bread of life, which never perishes. Martha rightly attended to the physical needs of her guests, but did so with much serving and was worried and troubled about many things. By such excess attention to serving, she had ignored that good part that Mary had chosen, which will not be taken away from her. Likewise, we uh, are we to choose the, the eternal bread that sustains our souls rather than attend to physical needs to the exclusion of such spiritual food. Well, whether it be represented by monies or goods, has no moral content, the content Never having had life, much less a soul, it is neither inherently good nor evil. The use to which man puts it determines its propensity for accomplishing good or producing evil. The heart of man determines its use. 
Paul stated, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. <clears throat> Jesus warned his disciples to take heed and beware of covetousness for, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. Luke 12, chapter verse 15. He then tells of a certain rich man who proposed to build bigger barns to place his possessions. His trust and confidence were in riches. When his soul was required of him, his riches availed him little. So he who lays up treasure for himself is not rich towards God. Love of material things will prevent one from following Christ or reaching that eternal shore. A certain rich young ruler who had great wealth, who wished to know what he liked to inherit eternal life, uh, was told by Jesus to sell all he had, give the proceeds to the poor, and follow him. He would not do it because he loved his riches more. As much as Jesus would, uh, would that that ruler be saved, Jesus could not do it. Why? Because the ruler would not permit it. He had placed his trust in riches rather than in the Savior. How much better would uh, we would be to follow the wisdom of the sage of old who said, remove falsehood and lies far from me, give me neither poverty nor riches, feed me with the food allotted to me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Proverbs, the 30th chapter, verses 8 and 9. In 1 John, uh, 2nd chapter, verse 15 through 17, we are warned not uh, to not love the world or the things in the world. And why is that? Because if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And how long shall these lusts be with us? John says, and the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. God, the designer and creator of mankind, made man with all the physical appetites, which are manifestly evident in each of us because such is necessary for mankind. It's necessary for us to function in the flesh in this present age. The Greek word translated into the English word lust may also be translated into the English word desire, that is, strong desire. The word then can have a meaning that it is either good or evil. Lust, therefore, may not necessarily be base or immoral. It becomes such if its use is inconsistent with the will of heaven. We have evidenced herein that the heart of the man is the source of all his intents and actions, of all his good and evil desires. This is even more reason to keep your heart with diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Proverbs 4th chapter, verse 23. Why must we control our strong desires? because it leads to sin. In James, uh, we are told that uh, no one can say that he's tempted, tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted, nor does he himself tempt anyone, but each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when a desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it, when it is full grown, brings forth to death. James 1st chapter verses 13 through 15. And you might recall that the very first uh, sin recorded in Genesis 3, 6 included every type of sin spoken of in 1st uh, John 2nd chapter verses 15 through 17. As has been noted, we are commanded to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. We cannot have divided loyalties and be pleasing to God. In Nehemiah, the 10th chapter, verse 39, the latter part of that, it is said that we will not 
neglect the house of our God. When placing before the people of Israel the choice of whom they were to serve, Joshua made the emphatic uh, statement, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So it is clear that God and the son must come for all else. The extent to which this is the case may be demonstrated by the passage found in Luke 14 chapter verses 26 through 27. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life, also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my, my disciple. Are we then at liberty to disregard the well being of our parents and children in our service to the Lord? Well, no. Because of the preeminence of Christ in our lives, we will be better children to our parents and parents to our children. We will be better husbands and wives. Jesus said in John, the 14th chapter, verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. How do we know that we have the proper care and concern for our families and at the same time know that we are pleasing to God? John said, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Uh, 1 John 5th chapter verse 2 and 3. In Ephesians, the fifth chapter, verse 21, all the way through the sixth chapter, verse 9, we're told the duties of the husband and to the wife, and the wife to the husband, the father to the children, the children to the parents, the master to the slave, and the slave to the master. These are commandments from our Lord. Christ will not be slack in these duties. Our Christians will not be slack in these duties to their families. When then do we transgress this imperative that we hate that that is, love less our parents or children. It is when supposed devotion to them causes us to disregard the will of and duty to our Lord and Savior. It is when we ignore or acquiesce to or defend them in their transgressions. In Leviticus, the 10th chapter, verses 1 through 9, we are told that Nadab and Abihu, Abihu offered incense before, before the Lord that was not authorized. Because they did not sanctify God, sanctify God in this act, they went out of fire from the Lord, which killed them. Their disregard of the will of God caused their death. Moses forbade Aaron and his other sons to mourn the death that they have in the bayou. We are not to mourn the loss of relationships that stand between us and our God. Rather, we are to mourn that which is displeasing to God. The pursuit of secular interests of whatever nature has caused many a fall. It may be in business, politics, community service, or other service organizations, or you, you name it. The thing pursued may be riches or honor or power. If these things compete in our hearts with God, then a fall has taken place. James tells of certain ones who say, Today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make profit. The reality, however, is whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. James, the fourth chapter, verses 13 through 16. Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. <clears throat> right living prepares us for heaven. It is in this life and how we live it that we demonstrate whether we are meet for the kingdom. Indeed, if we live in rebellion to God in this life, we will live in rebellion for all eternity because that is what pleases us. We take no pleasure in, in living righteously before God in this life. We would be miserable having to do so in heaven. So we conclude that such one is not meet for the kingdom. <clears throat> 
In Luke, the 16th chapter, verses 19 through 31, Jesus tells us about the rich man and Lazarus. During this life, the rich man had no regard for Lazarus, Lazarus in his poverty. His only interest was in himself, his riches, his well-being. Both died. Jesus was carried by the angels to the bosom of Abraham in paradise. The rich man went to a place of torment. The rich man saw Lazarus in comfort and petitioned Abraham to send Lazarus to him that he may dip his finger in water to cool the rich man's tongue. The rich Abraham said that such could not be done because of the thick gulf between them. The rich man then appealed to Abraham to send Lazarus to his five brothers to get them to repent so they would not have to experience his torment. Abraham said they have Moses and the prophets to warn them. The rich man rebelled against God during his life on earth and continued his rebellion and torment by reproving Abraham that Moses and the prophets were not enough, but one sent from the dead would, be, would accomplish what he desired. The rich man carried his rebellious character into eternity. We also have, as it were, Moses and the prophets speaking to us. Will we hear them? It is clear, therefore, that we decide in this life where we wish to spend eternity. How are we to live before God? Well, Paul says that for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, saying we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Who gave himself for us that we might redeem that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Titus second chapter verse eleven through fourteen. <clears throat> we learn from Psalms one nineteen verse seventy two that all your commandments are righteousness. Paul tells the young Timothy to pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart, 2 Timothy, the second chapter, verse 22. Keeping God's commandments from the heart, then, is righteous living. One, of course, must know the commandments and how to correctly apply them. In 2 Timothy, second chapter, verse 15, we're instructed to be diligent, to present yourselves through to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. John tells us that your word is truth, John 17, 17. Finally, in that great section of scripture in 2 Timothy, the second chapter, verses 15 through all the way through the third chapter, verse 17, on how to be profitable master, master service, Jesus concludes by telling Timothy to continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And that doesn't leave anything out. As Paul tells Timothy, we should ask, how are we to be profitable in the master's service? Paul perhaps said it the best in 2 Timothy, the second chapter, verse 15, all the way to the third chapter, verse 17, and we've already commented on that. So what are we to conclude from all this? It may be that the writer of old has said it best. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter, fear God and keep his commandments. For this is man's all, or as the King James says, this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. It comes from Ecclesiastes, the 12th chapter, verses 13 through 14. My exhortation tonight then is, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things, Philippians, the fourth chapter, verse eight. 
So that concludes my remarks for tonight and appreciate your kind attention to them.